Good morning to you. My name is Leo Marillier. I'm a violinist and second year master student, and I'd like to present to you today some concluding and performing remarks pertaining to my research on Beethoven's dynamics and form. I believe, and that is the main point behind the research, that a complete revelation of Beethoven's markings must be led by performers and researchers so that we can perceive and correctly undermine the complexities of Beethoven's texts. In that sense, my research question for, th for this exposition is how can we, as performers, bring forth the extremes and novelty of Beethoven's oeuvre? First, I'd like to talk about the origins of my interest for Beethoven's thought and its realization. I met and studied for a few lessons with violinist Nicholas Kitchen of the Borromeo String Quartet when I studied in Boston's New England Conservatory, taking and observing lessons in string, quart in string quartet formation. Kitchen wrote an extensive papers on Beethoven's dynamic markings, as well as typographical transcriptions of some late quartet manuscripts. At the same time, I was working as librarian at the conservatory, which has a quite thorough array of manuscript sources from all eras. I became acquainted with the fact that the musical text is not as fixed as it seems, that the smallest change can bring new consequences to the course of the work. At the same time as well, I took Deborah Stein's course on music and ambiguity, in which she mainly argued that pluridirectionality in a musical form brings tension and purpose to the work. Pluridirectionality is a very broad category, and its expression in different eras of classical music covers many different parameters. Schenkerian analysis is a good example of this. With a focus on the harmonic parameter, we dismiss the rhythmic and therefore proportional qualities of a work. Stein helped me understand how these agogic imbalances can help one understand the force of a work, like the use, or not, of repeats in a classical sonata form. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, due to the virus, I can't provide excerpts from a work because I I'm not at home. And also, very much at the same time, in Boston, I had begun to study with Miriam Fried, Beethoven's Violin Concerto. This was my last year of study with her, and it proved to be the biggest challenge for me. Also, I... I had some quite recent experience with the Duty Master String Quartet, and I myself joined as first violin the Vasily String Quartet, and this has provided me with a lot of time to think and, and, and reflect upon music. Um, these four quite different aspects of musical study, so the energy of chamber music and its relationship to text, the stoicism of manuscripts of libation, the uncharted territories of musical analysis, and one's own struggle with instrument and form, were linked together. During the years following this knot, I kept on studying the concerto by Beethoven, recording it in or with orchestra in March of 2018, using my, my own version of the very thickly varied manuscript, using theories of hypermeter I'd learned with Mrs. Stein in the spirit of the Burmey Quartet's vivid interpretations. The result, of course, was not a final one, but a work in progress. The research you've read is a further step, I hope. So that's my, my research is for the bigger part based on the writing of Nicholas Kitchen, Bart van Oort, and Deborah Stein. I took their ideas and tried to combine them in my own analysis of the Kreutzer Sonata and the Veiling Concerto to come to new understandings of interpretation. Analysis and interpretation might have different means, you know, whether you start your analysis on the macro or micro level, and the same goes for interpretation. Let me move on to the first example out of two or three I would like to discuss in this presentation. Here is the opening of the piano part manuscript of the Kreutzer Sonata. So this is, of course, a very unusual opening in that it disconnects completely both instruments in the fact that it also is a slow introduction which is quite peculiar in a classical form for chamber music. So let's look at the dynamic markings that um, we've uh, seen from Nicholas Kitchen's papers. So we see um, bar 5, F, P, so P is with two underlines, then P with one underline uh, in bar 8, then S, F, P, bar 10, and finally P with one underline in bar 11. 
Kitchen's theory is that these dashes imply different character and, in fact, uh, imply progression from one side to the next, so a, di a dialogue, but, but within the piano dynamic. So I tried to um, unite this theory with Bart van Oort's illuminating take in his uh, article Understanding Classical and Early Romantic Dynamics. I think there is a relationship between the use of these peculiar dynamic dashes and whether they are subito or not. I, I, this was just an example. I won't indulge you with my piano playing uh, because there isn't one where I am. So here's the corresponding violin part and see what we can do with it. So that's the opening of the of the violin part of the Kurt Susanna. We have F R with a, di a, um, a drawn diminuendo, then P with one other line in bar one, uh, which is instead of the F diminuendo P uh, that we have in well, all editions. Um, the two next signs are SFP, bar um, 9 and 11, then SF, and then followed by a P with one other line. So why is this last piano dynamic dashed? Because we have, I think, an, entered in, uh, in a new hypermetric and harmonic unit. We left uh, the, the harmonic progression, which was... Uh, driving the first section of the of the of the introduction. Well, even though we might have thought that bar eleven, so this bar was our arrival, due to its um, tense harmonic nature related to A major, but the fully written out crescendo, while not only implies a greater gesture than the two preceding uh, crescendi, according to Kitchen, but also a sudden increase of dynamic on the G sharp. Uh, so this is taking um, and extending uh, Bart van Oort's insight that crescendi under single notes in the late classical era are the equivalent of a rinforzando. So this insight is also quite valuable for 132, opus 132, string quartet in A minor, which I will speak of later. And so the, um, the P in bar 13, so the P uh, with one, or one underline, means uh, subito means that the SF placed before must not stop the ongoing crescendo, especially since the piano can't sustain the corresponding F either. The, um, the violin must sort of compensate the fact that the piano can't sustain the notes. Let's look at the opening chords of the piano and the violin part. My uh, speculation and opinion is that they are more different than what, what we might think. Um, I was told, and I will play this after, I was told varying advice when performing this chord, either a la stern, so not breaking the chord, or in the manner of uh, sharing, breaking it into two notes and two notes, um, kind of like the, 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 the piano's uh, writing for the um, bar five, or third way, arpeggiating it. So, the, the following statement is my opinion and my change according to the primary criteria uh, for a musician, which uh, I think the main criteria is whether it sounds good. Um, so, in the, in the violin part, the FR instead of F in the first note implies a grander but also a certain roundness. So, I, I try to play without breaking the chord but with some consonant on the top note, dropping little by little the C sharp so as to interpret the um, the drone diminuendo as um, a sort of harmonic refinement with uh, the top A left alone leading to the next chord. The P with one other line is, I think, obtained by uh, distributing the weight that was on the top A on the two notes of the next double stop, so D and F sharp. Uh, with a small emphasis on the lower voice for a more sustained and more intense sound. You know, had it been a normal piano dynamic, I would have done it 50-50 uh, with the two strings. So, for example, uh, the piano part upon its entrance, um, F and P with two underlines, means that the P with two underlines must be obtained within the first note. It's, it's something which m might not be obvious, knowing that in the classical era and in my experience, for example, in Haydn string quartets, when you have an FP, it might mean that uh, it's forte on one note, undepending on its length, 
and uh, piano dynamic in the next note. Um, but how can we how can we do that? How can we do F and P uh, within the same note by realizing that while the chord is quite an empty one in the piano part, there is no middle register. Um, but uh, but here here are the violin chords, the first phrase, in uh, in those three manners. So unbroken, broken two and two, and the way I would play it. So as a way of giving us uh, some um, launching platform into the next section, which is about the concerto, I, I think I've shown how these two theories uh, can be intertwined of, you know, Kitchen's special dynamics and, and the fact that um, Bart van Oort's article uh, really deals with the instrumental or abstract quality of the writing. And, well, you know, many of Bitterman's works can be seen as written against the instrument, the proof being this new use of dynamics, which he knows can only be achieved with a certain difficulty on the instrument, and that's why he writes such, well, let's say it, difficult uh, dynamics. So, we, well, in conclusion, these two theories can come together upon close, uh, upon close inspection of the text, given the fact that Beethoven's own evol evolutive form, um, the fact that, well, he, yeah, he, he went out of the classical... A sonata form and gave it a more um, or organic uh, development. Well, this gives way to some incredible uh, exploration from from the part of the performer. Kitchen's um, perspective and opinion, I think, often often leads him to conclude that expressive power is both the cause and the effect of observing such effects. Um, I'd like to go a little further and say that with Van Oort, uh, these dynamics, uh, special dynamics, give more structural understanding of the work. I think Beethoven uses form uh, so as to give a critic of form. But um, now we're leaving the, the Kreutzer Sonata's very intricate opening and the Sonata genre as a whole. Um, the more advanced um, Beethoven was, the, the, the more Beethoven advanced to maturity, the less he seems to rely on the piano as a heroic means of innovation. And, um, and well, he kept the piano as a solo instrument for more uh, conceptual, small-scale research. Uh, and instead of that, the orchestra takes up in the middle period the heroic mental the piano had in his creative output until... 1803, and so the, the symphonic scope, the advancement of wind techniques, and the evolution and accumulation of the symphony as a genre came to an incredible uh, creative outburst from um, 1803 to 1808. This gave Beethoven new challenges when it comes to scoring, since... Um, Uh, since innovation set in the symphonic writing is either 
Well, innovation in the symphony grinding is it's either less obvious, more hidden, or it's more out of place, uh, given the general opinion on orchestral writing, which, well, in general, I think it's, it can be accepted that it's a, it's, a, it's a generalization, but it's got some part of truth that orchestra should blend its own color and its own parts. And actually, many orchestral works by Beethoven don't respect this blend. And uh, in fact, uh, when I was preparing this presentation, I, I came upon a, a magnificent work by uh, art theorist Anton Herrenzweig, The Hidden Order of Art, um, presenting and uh, analyzing relationships between stages of uh, psychological development and stages of creative endeavor and the ambiguous relationship between the unknown unconscious and the final product of art. And it's really, really incredible. He describes um, Beethoven art as the imminence in, this, in, the, in the field of art, in the, uh, uh, um, as the imminence of the break, of the rupture, as the main constitutive element of music, of Beethoven, of Beethoven's composition style, and, the, and this gives all the more difficulty of the performer in the acceptance of the infinite breaking power uh, which is now inscribed in music, because with Beethoven's the the fact that sometimes for a, for a work he first comes up with the idea of a transition instead of that of a theme, well, it's all the more difficult, let's say, um, for a performer to to kind of get what exactly is the essence of a work, and so the essence of a work is often uh, antagonism. Um, well, due to my isolation and confinement, due to the virus, I can't access any exact quotes. Um, but this reading um, led me to an idea. So if you can, if you may take a theme, like the first theme of the, of the Wedding Concerto, uh, you can come up with the idea of a theme, so that theme has several readings, several ways it can be manipulated as, well, composer mostly, and performer uh, as well, in an hour or manner it can be manipulated. Uh, this manipulation of the theme is leading the form forward. However, uh, the theme, that theme that you can see and read, has intrinsic qualities that define it, which cannot be altered, like you know, harmonic direction, registers, um, even instrumentation sometimes. Uh, the theme can only be developed in its own confines, and you can see that very clearly in the Violin Concerto, because all the violin can do is actually um, just ornament around the, um, the 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 orchestral texture, which uh, constantly you know, repeats themes. Um, however, if the main idea behind a work or a form is a transition, a key change, or any kind of difference, uh, there are myriad more ways the material can be altered, because the ma because the main material. The clay that the creator uses is in motion by itself, within itself. I think it's a. This is, I think, a, a fruitful comparison to uh, what I wrote in my paper concerning homeomorphism and my discussion about accidental and and the the accidental and the essential qualities of theme. So, Herodsfeig's insight in Beethoven helped me accept that Beethoven focuses on antagonism, um, that he focuses on a gap, on an imbalance, like, for example, between timpani and woodwinds. So, the polyphonic strands that make up orchestral writing in its essence are a better vessel for conveying rupture uh, than a, a, a single piano can. So this is my theory for Beethoven's growing interest in the orchestra coinciding with his developing art of rupture. So this 
as I've shown in the paper, is very much related to the Vining Concerto, which has a serene surface quality to the, due to the fixedness, fixed, fixedness, sorry, fixedness of its individual part. So each, each of the woodwind, strings, brass wires having very delimited functions, and the solo part as well. But the internal workings are arduously difficult to understand and convey. So the performing example I've chosen to show you today is one I've already talked about in the paper, um, which I'd like to show the many facets of for the performer. So here's an excerpt from the recording with orchestra I made two years ago. Incidentally, though I didn't know about the, the, the Breitkopf Urtex edition from uh, 1969 then, I, uh, I chose to separate, to separate both uh, Espressivo half notes in the, in the recording. I think one can hear quite well that there are uh, dynamic differences between the bass line, the motif uh, in, third and in thirds, and the solo line. And, uh, well, here are, uh, according to different, well, editions, ways of playing, readings, which uh, corroborate with certain editions and especially, um, consequently, certain bowings. And so let's uh, finish with um, some remarks about the String Quartet Opus 132, which I've had the, 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 the pleasure of performing as a second violin with uh, the Diotima String Quartet, and uh, which I'm currently performing with the Vasily String Quartet as first violin. So this is bars 70 to 72 from the first movement. Um, well, um, my theory is that given the given that the second bar repeats harmonically uh, the first, the crescendo sign indicates a sudden uptake in dynamic, or at least the fact that the repose we might have arrived at at the end of the first bar is in fact disturbed by the new direction that is given through the crescendo, literally throwing us toward the commencing development section. And so here are two interpretations of the text, and so the latter with the subito crescendo. And here I think uh, Bart van Oort's advice is very useful, because in the second bar, uh, in the second half, there is automatically an uptake in uh, sound, because in sound production, because everybody except the first venin has double stops. So here are two interpretations. So this is the magical opening of uh, the third movement. Um, 
On a purely anal analytical point, the Half Notes Chorale, at each of its iteration, iterations in this first adagio section, goes further and further from uh, its primal, primary harmonic symmetry, which you can observe uh, in the first, at the end of the first line. Um, and I think the difference between the drawn and the written crescendos is this, uh, according to me. When drawn, the sound grows within each note, whereas when it is written, C-R-E-S-C, -E and etc., uh, it is a step-by-step -step process. Each note is louder, but within each note, the dynamic level is the same. So this view is confirmed below by the fact that each note has its own crescendo reinforcement line. And so this comes from Nicholas Kitchen's advice. And, uh, and I think it fits quite well with, um, well, uh, Beethoven's current, well, uh, <laughs> back, in, <laughs> back in 1825, uh, interest with uh, choral writing. You know, he had just finished the first, well, the first, well, the only one, the Misa Solemnis, and he was sort of planning to do a second one in C-sharp minor, uh, which I think ended up being very, very simply, the 14th string quartet. And um, and uh, now I'm going to play um, the two um, first crescendo, so, uh, cre uh, sorry, written crescendo sections. So the, the one at the end of the first line and the one at the end of the first line of the third page. Um, just as a little comment, um, when I was talking about, about the, the, the written crescendo and the reinforcement marks matching each new note, uh, these reinforcement marks do not appear as such in the Henley edition, so I, I think we lose some of the meaning that we might have when looking at the manuscript. And so, one concluding example from 132 concerning crescendos. So this is the opening of the recitativo preceding the Allegro Appassionato last movement. So the crescendo at the end of the first of the, of the line here theoretically starts well, well on the second beat, and lasts well, approximately three quarters of a second. Um, well, there are no dynamics in the first violin part, and given the opposition set up uh, between first violin and the three lower voices, and the, the great freedom given to the performer, um, a subito louder dynamic on the second beat of bar five for the three lower lower voices, I would advise uh, doing a subito mezzo forte or something, especially given the fact that According to my reading of the manuscript and the corrections that you can see in here, uh, the crescendo originally was to start on the third rather than on the second beat. And also, um, there is some deep harmonic contrast. And this, between the first and the second beats, and this is such an, an, an expected change, especially happening on a weak beat, uh, that, it, yes, uh, a sudden mezzo forte dynamic is all the more effective rather than rushing, than trying to do a, a, a crescendo in under a second, which uh, I think is quite pointless if you want to bring out the drama of uh, of this spot. 
So here's me playing it. Um, so this is now reaching the end of um, of this oral presentation and the end um, of the research. Even though I I won't, um, I don't think I'll ever well, stop thinking about these things. Um, yeah, a close inspection of of these manuscripts really led me to to think that they have something which cannot be reproduced in a way, at least at the moment, in uh, in modern editions that um, knowledge and awareness of all these uh, shades of meaning, of all these interrelated systems of, um, of, of, of innovation, of the interpretation and analysis of a work, you know, between um, the harmonic meaning, um, the instrumental meaning of a certain dynamic, um, I think that this uh, innovation in Beethoven's manuscripts of um, these dynamic shadings really helps us understand that Beethoven knew what he was doing <laughs> and uh, he he was not um, looking for any kind of uh, confirmation outside of his own work that um, in fact, uh, dynamics is often the last. Um, dynamics is often the thing that he looked at the more clearly. The the one that he kind of believed was the more important in order to bring um, the revolutionary quality of a work. And um, looking at different sources, looking at different uh, visions of a work really, really helps me um, understand what freedom I am in uh, uh, as a performer, what kind of freedom I can follow, um, the fact that as a performer I can choose between mainly this is a very broad point, mainly uh, choosing between um, putting forth the harmonic contents of a work, the structural contents or the melody content contents of a work, and for each of these things I would not be uh, betraying the texts and, and the sources and the manuscripts, and I think that that is something <laughs> that's very comforting because, you know, but, um, the bit of an education in conservatories can be sometimes very, very stiff uh, in, and almost sterile because the text and the character of the text is really um, impregnating our minds already. And uh, I think that sometimes innovation is better placed when it's rare, um, you know, subito dynamics are all the more effective when you really understand way, when and where they happen. Thank you.